Let's bring in two guests to talk about Opportunity Zones. Uh, joining us is Operation Hope's founder, Chairman and CEO, John Hope Bryant. He's also the founder of Promise Homes. And Heritage Foundation Senior Policy Analyst Adam Michelle joins us from Washington. John, you're here on set with us. Um, obviously, you want to see a lot of this economic development, but are you concerned uh, about the way it's being monitored? Well, I'm always concerned about Washington, D.C. But, look, as long as this is not, first of all, uh, the, the, the issue about <clears throat> some of these projects are in neighborhoods that are aspiring. If you hang around nine broke people, you'll be the tenth. So you want some of this stuff to ride a wave. You don't just want it compressed in what's called poor neighborhoods. <laughs> you have to have this aspirational lift. The problem with this legislation is only one thing, lazy public policy. <laughs> in Manhattan, you have structured everything. Everything is, is structured and curated. As long as this policy is structured and curated, meaning that you've got financial literacy at the bottom, financial coaching in the middle, because it's what people don't know that they don't know that's killing them, but they think they know. You know, Abraham Lincoln created this Freedmen's Bank to teach free slaves about money, 1865, after the Civil War. He was killed the next month. It wasn't like black folks got a memo on free enterprise and screwed it up. We just never got the memo. So, it's, so as long as we have the coaching, and I, was with, I was met with the administration, in all fairness, yesterday, about this very topic, uh, uh, so as long as they do coaching at the bottom, I'm sorry, coaching in the middle and financial literacy at the bottom, and not just have capital at the top, otherwise it'll be a rocket ship on a wagon wheel. It will explode. And it will be what the Heritage Foundation says, it's a disaster. If they do what I'm saying and others are saying, it could be the best public policy move for the so-called poor in 50 years. In other words, you could have a little Marshall Plan, little M, little P, CRA reform, Community Reinvestment Act, that's flexible debt. Then you've got Public, pu public, pur public purpose capitalism, or fringe capital, opportunity zone funds. And then you've got the grease in the gears, which is financial literacy, which we all got from our, from our, our parents without even knowing it. You grew up you know, with, with it, uh, your memo attached to your baby bib because it, your family was teaching financial literacy because they, they were wearing a suit talking about stocks and bonds. We need that in these communities. Do that as a combination, you have a winning policy. Adam, let's talk about that because when Robert first laid out the report, this idea of investing in areas that, that maybe aren't at the bottom of the barrel, that aren't struggling the most, um, not a bad idea if you think about trying to build things up, but maybe the lack of <coughs> foresight is the biggest concern you hear here. Well, I think we all can agree that we want Americans across the country and every community to benefit from the strong economy we see today. But I don't, opportunity zones aren't the way to get there. These zones were picked by well-connected politicians to benefit Wall Street, and they're quite the opposite of the rest of the broad-based reforms that were included in the 2017 tax reform. It's lower taxes broadly available to all Americans that are fueling some of the largest wage gains for the lowest-income Americans, keeping the unemployment rate at historic lows. Uh, I've written about this at Heritage.org. It's doubling down on these types of policies, broad-based reforms. These are the, this is the way to help the most Americans and the Ameri Americans that need it the most. You know, uh, I, I, I respect his view, and, and I'm glad he's pushing back. It's the best part about America. But I actually grew up in the hood, like D-A hyphen H-O-O-D, mm -hmm. the hood. <laughs> uh, Compton, California, and South Central Los Angeles. So I'm from Main Street to Wall Street. And I'm telling you, done right, you're, you're attracting capital to yeah, neighborhoods. But, that, but here's ahead, the thing. No, no, no. But, but, but Compton's a great example because if I'm an investor and I've just cashed out, this is a program created by Sean Parker. He said I, all of us in Silicon Valley have billions of dollars in stock that we don't want to sell or give up because there's capital gains tax. So we created this program. If you have capital, are you going to put it into a luxury hotel in L.A.'s design district or in affordable housing in Compton uh, for a 10-year well, let's, return? Let's, let's, if, capital is going to go where, where it feels like it's got the best chance of success, and maybe Compton is the right place for it to go. But from an investor point of view, what do you think that decision is going to be? I think the market is going to go where they see profit. And you have 100 million Americans who, are, who need to be re rehabilitated and put into the game. Your untapped potential for new GDP is actually at the bottom of the pyramid. But Let's get out of theory for a minute. Yeah. 25 years, I did Operation Hope. I'm still doing Operation Hope. That's my, that's my deal. But I decided to eat my own formula. I was tired of telling capitalists what to do. And I'm tired of Joe ignoring me while I'm talking. No, I'm sorry, not talking that. I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the no, numbers. I'm, messing with, I'm, messing I'm with trying to tie what I'm trying to figure out how to tie what Mark Lazary said earlier. I'm what, messing with what you, you're saying. Actually, no. you're, you're, you're a cool guy. You're an honorary brother. I got you. So, uh, <laughs> so, so what I did was two years ago, I went to two hardcore capitalists, Tony Ressler and Michael Argetti, uh, who are nice guys, but it's about the profit. 
and I decided to eat my own formula, a for-profit company, completely separate, called the Promise Homes Company. In these same neighborhoods, not in the major market, 28 counties, Atlanta, Florida, so on and so forth. And we applied the same formula in an underserved neighborhood, affordable housing, uh, zero assets in 2017. Now it's $100 million in assets, double-digit return, 2% delinquency rate, 95% uh, occupancy, $1,000 affordable rent. Uh, they're getting an incredible return for being, proving you don't have to be a jerk to be a capitalist. Uh, and, and we contract, first thing we did was contract or become a member, a paid member of Operation Hope to be, provide financial coaching to these residents. So we, we, again, not lazy public policy, leaned in, did it right, same thing you're talking about, in an underserved market, and it's doing just like this. Yeah. I'm saying everybody can do that, and everybody should do that. But look, at the end of the day, we're, and I would agree with you, because really what you want, money is going to go where they think they're going to make money, right? So you're looking at it and saying, look, should it be a hotel? Should it be sort of housing? At the end of the day, all I'm going to do is look at where I'm going to make money, and if I think there's an opportunity, you're going to do it, yeah. right? So I, I, I think it will have the effect. Yes, you're going to end up having, some people are going to go, look, I'd rather end up being in an area where I think there's less risk. But you're going to have a lot of people who are going to look at it and go, look, there may be more risk in Compton, but I think I'm going to get compensated for that. I think I'm going to make more money. Um, so I'm going to do that. And I, I think you're going to have more need for what you're talking about just because you don't need more hotels. Thank you. That, that's, that's sort of ultimately how I would look at it. And let me tell you what, whether the market does well or does, or does not do well, let me tell you what, people who are the postal workers, Walmart managers, UPS drivers, they're still going to need some place to live at $1,000 to $1,200, $1,500 a month. That's going to be forever, right? And there's not enough of that in this marketplace. And I, I can't tell you how many times... Uh, uh, Joe's and Becky's friends come to me and say, "I, I want to do well and do good. I want to. I, I want to be a good. I, I want to be a good guy too. How do I? How do I make a solid investment? Right. But still, you know, I want to. I want to be a hardcore business. But but I, I want to have some compassion and I want to have a legacy of knowing that I help society too. This is an opportunity. So I actually respectfully disagree with a commenter who says that opportunity zones is a, is a bad idea. You don't turn away billions of dollars going into the hood. You don't. You try to make it, you figure out a way to make it work. Adam, so, what do you it, say? Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, it, these ahead. programs like this have been tried at the state level, at the federal level, internationally, and, and every time they've been tried, they, they have not led to higher wages or more job opportunities, and often they've led to uh, worse outcomes for the people that we're you're trying to help. Yes, you can see investment mm -hmm. move from one side of the line to the other. But what politicians aren't telling you is, is that, the, that, that that investment would have happened on that other side of the street rather than on, on, the, on, on the new side of the street that's privileged by Washington. And they certainly aren't telling you about the, the, peop, the Americans across the country that are funding the subsidy that's allowing Washington to pick winning areas, areas and losing areas. The best way to, to support broad-based growth is with equally applied policies at the federal level and targeted local reforms at the state and local level where, where things like zoning reform can allow for more housing, where, where education choice can allow families to pick the best educational options for their children. These are the sort of local institutional reforms that help the most people. Alex? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we see a gap in the market where you can actually go to these neighborhoods. We're buying thousands of homes every year and doing major rehab on them. And there is a double bottom line because not only are you buying uh, these houses, you're making them better and you're giving families across the country uh, a better life because they, they want a good life as well for a thousand or twelve hundred dollars. And it is a double bottom line because you're making great returns, but you're also making neighborhoods across America better. Which, which suggests you, you shouldn't need a tax incentive or a tax break that costs the government nearly $2 billion a year to do that, right? If there is that genuinely great return that you're talking about, and you're talking about, why do you need it to be a tax loophole? Because it doesn't program? hurt. Here, here's the thing. It always sounds great, and I apologize. I know when you know, the person was talking... It's, yeah, you would love to have great public policy. You would love to have a lot of these things. So what, what's the harm? The harm is well, that, fine, cost. no, there's a cost. cost. It's $2 billion, yeah. or whatever the number is. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a number of people that are helped. So if you end up saying that capitalism is going to solve every problem, I'd love that to happen. It doesn't. Yeah. 
So ultimately, why not give a push? It may not be the best program out there, but it ends up helping people. And then from there, you can see the mistakes you've made, and you can say, look, we're going to do more. We're going to try to fix it. Capital coming in, you need capital. The fact that the federal government, you've said, look, there's this tax loophole, and it's, you know, it's cost us money. I can show you a thousand things where that it's cost a lot us, more. Absolutely. Yeah, that's just cost us yeah. money. So there's going to be mistakes. Let's learn from them. And then five years from now, you can say, hey, here's how we should have done it. But during that time, you've helped a number of people. So, and the so, ripple effect, yeah. Well, I mean, the ripple effect of actually having jobs out there, creating, uh, you know, stimulating the economy, creating better homes. But if it costs you $2 billion and you have all this liquidity, you want to get that money from the sidelines into the U.S. Absolutely. market and not to Europe and not to yes. Asia. And that's exactly it why it was created, because he said there are all these investors like him that, that the money yes. is locked up and places that are desperate for capital don't have it. So let's, let's uh, close that gap. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.